Hola niños, this is Pain from Young Justice Legacy, and you're listening to Whelmed the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognize, Connor, T, D, 5, 5. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Connor T. Davenport. Connor is one of the contributing writers over at DCTV.news, where he shares reviews, analysis, and news about all your favorite DC Comics television shows. And outside of DCTV, he's also a writer of both YJ Fanfic and his own original work, as well as a lifelong comic book and sci-fi fan. Connor, I am so happy to welcome you to Wound. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons so far, the comics, and the video game. If you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in our intro, but could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do? Of course. Uh, my name is Connor T. Davenport, and I've been writing for DCTV News ever since April of 2020. I'm a passionate comic book fan who's been surrounded by these rich stories and iconic characters ever since I was a little kid. Not only that, but I'm also a sci-fi connoisseur, a huge movie buff, a diehard fan of classic rock music, and I am also a walking library of knowledge on surrounding my favorite TV show, Doctor Who. <laughs> Outside of my interests, I currently work at a movie theater, which is perfect for a cinema geek like me. I act in local theater productions, and I practice my craft every day to become a really big esteemed writer one day, like my role models, which include Ray Bradbury, Douglas Adams, Neil Gaiman, Russell T. Davies, and of course, Greg Weissman. Lots of great names on that list. I didn't know you were into Doctor Who, but I'm not surprised. No, that's that's great. Uh... (laughs) Doctor Who is like my life. I love it so much. It's, it's very fun. I have not, I haven't watched the, like the most recent seasons, but for a while I was very, I was very into it and should probably get back into it and see the 13th Doctor at some point. <laughs> I really like what Jodie Whittaker is doing with the role of the 13th Doctor. And I think you would be, you're in for a real nice treat. You're going to be in for some really fun episodes. <laughs> yes. I just, I just need to make the time at some point and just feel like I need to, I need to get back in. So. Uh, branching off of that, when did you first see Young Justice? Did you watch it on DVDs, on Netflix, or did you catch it when it originally aired? Or something else entirely, <laughs> now that DC Universe existed? Uh, I was first introduced to Young Justice back in January of 2016 while I was searching for new comic book related shows on Netflix. I always knew of its existence beforehand, and I was genuinely interested about checking it out, but for some reason I always just kept pushing it back before <laughs> one day... I finally sat down with my dad and we just binge watched the entire first two seasons and I was immediately hooked on these brilliantly written storylines and these super well-developed characters. After we were done binging the show, I soon went out and bought all the DVDs once I heard there was a genuine possibility of it coming back. And I remember on November 7, 2016 when they announced season 3, I swear the feeling I had was almost similar to that of winning the lottery. I was ecstatic that my favorite show was coming back. Yes, yes. I've I've told my story of finding out when it came back many times. Like I feel like that day of that announcement, many of our guests are like, I remember where I was when that announcement (laughs) came out. It's great. And you so you watched it with your dad. Is your dad a big comic book fan too, or did he just think it sounded cool? Uh, my dad is a huge comic book fan, and that nice. kind of goes into, uh, I grew up being surrounded by, uh, my dad's love of comic books. Like, I'm somebody who not only just loves Marvel and DC, my dad let me, like, read his old comic books as a kid, and we watched a lot of superhero movies and shows, and one of the first shows I was introduced to superhero-wise was another Greg Weissman production called The Spectacular Spider-Man, <laughs> which is, for lack of a better term, spectacular. <laughs> And um, 
not only Marvel and DC, but I love Valiant Comics, I love Image Comics, Dark Horse Comics, 2000 AD. I am just a comic book freak, and I really do owe that to my dad, who uh, let me kind of be immersed in this world ever since I was really, really young, and I'm really grateful for that. Nice. That actually, that actually was going to answer my next question about what your history with comics was, but there we go. <laughs> I have a very rich history. <laughs> Lifelong love. Yep. That's always great to hear. And it's always great having that as like a thing that you can share with your family and with your parents like that. That's great. Uh, I share a lot of similar interests with my father because we are both like, he's kind of the one who introduced me to like Star Wars and Doctor Who and uh, Star Trek. He, I just uh, was able to embrace all this stuff thanks to my father. Because let's be real, I'm really grateful that I was given these types of interests because I know nothing about sports. And if I ever tried to play a sport in real life, I would most likely break like a twig. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to find the right sport. And I say that as someone who like my whole life was like, I'm so unathletic. And then people are like, didn't you do 13 years of dance and now have done multiple years of circus? And I'm like, that's true. I forget that those are athletic things. <laughs> I did not know you did dance and circus. That's pretty cool. I'm a, I'm a strange, I'm a strange creature. Yeah, no, but I think I think the the nerd can coexist with the doing of the athletic things. But it is very nice when you have the family have a family that is willing to support whatever it is that you're into, whatever the thing that you're like. This is kind of weird, and having a family who's like, no, this is this is fine. This is us is so great. Yeah, I'm super grateful because uh, I do come from a very open minded family, and even if I'm not the best at sports, I don't know if checkers counts as a real sport. Uh, I've still got a lot of great family and friends who uh, help let me show who I am and I don't have to hide behind some fake facade, you know? Yeah. So when we were narrowing down what we wanted to talk about on this episode, one of the topics that you were most excited about was talking about the villains of Young Justice, uh, which is such a rich and amazing topic to dive into for this kind of thing. So... Let's let's start with something big and we'll narrow it down and we'll just jump around with this. Like, what do you think, as our guest today, makes a good villain, both either in general or in superhero media specifically or both? Let's start there. That's a very good question. When it comes to what makes a good villain, especially in, say, comic book properties, this is something you'll probably hear in, say, in a high school English class. But sometimes that's how my mind works. But I like to stick to my very own personalized acronym that I came up with, like, say, five, six years ago. I've been writing for a while. Hippo. Uh, no, I am not referring to any hippo-related villains. <laughs> uh, but what hippo stands for is, uh, do you mind if I kind of go into, like, what each letter stands for specifically? Go for it. I've Go for it. I've never heard this before. Wonderful. Uh, hippo stands for five words. Humanity, interest value, personality, perspective, and objective. Those are the five main ingredients, though, in my opinion, that makes a great villain. Starting off with humanity, no great villain is ever just wakes up and is like, ooh, I'm going to do bad today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, each villain, like whether it's someone like, say, Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lambs, there's still that sense of they have human feelings too. They may not show it, but you've got to understand that villains feel happy, villains can feel sad, villains can feel anger. You've got to understand that all of these emotions are in these characters. And you've got to find ways to interpret it in various different ways that can be uh, properly make the audience uh, understand that this is not just a cardboard cutout. This is a real type of person or living being. I stands for interest value because... Let's be real here. We don't want to watch a villain that you just feel like, okay, we get it. We got your evil plan. Now get off the screen. You know, with interest value, you've got to have a villain that can captivate you. You've got to have a villain that can really make you think and make you feel like, wow, I'm actually feeling genuinely, let's say, I feel like a good word to use in this scenario is you feel like a sensation inside of you. Like, you feel something other than, oh god, this guy's on the screen again. A good example would be uh, one of my favorite comic book movies of all time, I feel like with a lot of people, is The Dark Knight. And I don't think there has ever been a greater villain, in my opinion, than Heath Ledger's Joker. And that is a character 
every second he's on screen, you can just, you just want to know more about this guy. You want to see more of what he does. You want to see what's going on in his head. And every time you see him, you just have the interest level raised up to a thousand. And it's just, you need villains like that. You don't want to have villains like, say, the villain in Thor The Dark World. I believe his name was Malkith. You don't want to have that type of villain. No offense to Thor The Dark World, which I actually do think is an all right movie. It's just that villain wasn't exactly the best. I love Christopher Eccleston, though. <laughs> it's you, ne- you need your audience to be invested in whatever the villain is doing. Uh, you, need, you need that kind of investment, just like wanting to know what they're doing, what they're thinking, everything that you were saying, just wanting to know more about this villain. If a villain walks on screen and you just go, okay, you're here, uh, <laughs> that villain has right. possibly failed a little bit. But yeah, it's that kind of investment from your audience, I feel like. You don't want to have a villain that people dread. Like when you want that dread, it's like, oh no, it's a sense of fear, not a sense of, oh, get off the stage. Oh, get off the screen. Yeah. You know, you've got to have a villain that just says, I'm here. The attention's on me. You're going to sit down. You're going to be quiet and you're going to listen. That that sense of dread that comes from what they're going to do to our characters or to the world at large, not what they're going to do the, to the story, if that makes sense. Like, right. you dread that they're there, not because they're going to ruin the story, but because they're going to ruin your favorite character's day. <laughs> you don't know, like with villains, like going back to the Heath Ledger uh, Joker example, this is a villain. You, I really like it when the villains are really unpredictable. That's why I love the character of the Joker in general. The Joker is somebody, yes, he may have some sort of general plan, but you don't know how he'll carry out that plan. For all we know, uh, when he says he's going to kidnap a bunch of children, put them on a school bus dangling over a bridge, he could be putting making that a complete bluff and instead blow up your girlfriend in a different building like miles away. Spoilers and for the Dark Knight. <laughs> precisely. I was going to say, and um, I feel like when it comes to a villain with really big interest, that villain leaves you with something unforgettable. Like you, there are so many forgettable villains out there, but there are still those types of villains that I really feel like if you make a really good impact on your audience, then you'll have done your job. Yeah. You have created an extraordinary villain. Yeah. And now the first P in Hippo stands for, this is probably one of my favorites, personality. I feel like when you have a villain, you've got to make sure he's not just bland and just straight up vanilla, you know? You've got to have a villain who is just so much fun to watch, but also he's got to have these different sort of dimensions to the personality. Uh, I hope you don't mind me using another Joker example, but I'm going to refer to another one of my favorite Jokers, Mark Hamill from Batman the Animated Series and the entire DC Animated Universe. Mark Hamill's Joker is probably one of the perfect mixtures of all the past Jokers combined while also putting in new elements. Uh, that type of Joker is funny, but he can also be really scary. He can be very charismatic, but he can be super arrogant and full of himself. When you have villains like that, you tend to understand what's going through their minds a little bit more, and you have the tendency to realize, oh, okay, this is not just some guy out to go take over the world or take over the galaxy. There are some legitimate ideas and philosophies behind him, and he has these like little eccentric quirks, and they have these little um, these little idiosyncr- idiosyncrasies that I think really make a character like Mark Hamill's Joker a real well-defined three-dimensional character. Yes. And uh, when it comes to the second P in Hippo, it's perspective. Uh, when it comes to a villain, like I feel like the first one that comes to my mind is Eric Killmonger from Black Panther. Uh, Black Panther is probably one of my favorite recent comic book movies in the past couple of years. And I feel like with that type of villain, you have to put yourself in that type of situation and you have to think to yourself, does this guy have a point? Does this guy really mean what he's doing? And do I am I able to identify with it in a way? Sure, they're doing it in a way that's obviously wrong since they're the antagonist. But if you were able to be in that type of situation and maybe just change a couple little things, then it could be no no way off from being straight up protagonist or even a hero. I feel like with a good villain, you've got to understand where they're coming from. Another example I'll use from the Marvel Cinematic Universe is Michael Keaton's Vulture in Spider-Man Homecoming. 
Uh, this is a guy who just wanted to support his family. He wanted to make a decent living. And when uh, Tony Stark came in, ripped that out from underneath him, he has to go out and do these illegal alien activities. But at the same time, you can understand why he's doing this. And with a good villain, you just have to see that when you see them kind of doing these bad things, you can also sit back and think, you know, they do kind of have a point, though. And I feel like that's a really good idea for when it comes to making a great antagonist. You've got to put yourself in their little perspective and see what kind of scenarios they're going through and whether or not you can relate to them. Even the villains that you look at and go, they don't have a point. They're definitely wrong. There's a famous line, and I don't know what it's from. It's become kind of a cliche at this point, but it's saying that every villain is the hero of their own story. Precisely. So even characters that you want your audience to look at and that you as the writer can look at and go, they're wrong. They're definitely wrong. Everything they're doing is wrong and horrible. But from their perspective, they're doing the right thing is kind of one of the, the kind of one of the more important things, I think, in that in that vein of even if you're making a character who is not a gray antihero or a possible possibly has a point, you can still be like, OK, but why are they doing what they're doing from their perspective, as you said? Right. And I feel like uh, the saying you just used, every villain is the hero of his or her story. That is probably the perfect way to summarize it, as you summarized it perfectly as well. At the end of the day, villains, whether they're human or not, they're still their own being. And we've got to see, hey, if I put myself in their shoes, could I be on their side a bit? Would I kind of be on the fence of whether or not I should be siding with the heroes or should I be siding with the villains? And I feel like that's really, really important when it comes to a story like that. As for the final letter in the HIPPO acronym, it's OBJECTIVE. Every villain, in my opinion, needs to have a clear, well-thought-out objective. Sure, you'll have some villains that will just be like Sniddly Whiplash from Dudley Do-Right who just want to cause mayhem for no reason. But some villains, even if they're just trying to do stuff like, uh, let's say, take over the world or just take over the entire universe, there's got to be a reason for that. They're not just going to wake up in the morning, like I said prior, and be like, hmm, okay, I'll take a shower, have a little breakfast, then I'll take over the entire planet Earth. That's not what a good villain does. There's got to be some reason behind that. And I feel like when you have to see the objective of one character, it can also correlate to perspective. If you can have objective and perspective together, you see their goal, you see where they're coming from, you can create not only a relatable villain, but a super memorable villain as well. Yeah. Though to, to be fair, while get up, take a shower, have some breakfast, take over the world is a horrible way to present a dramatic villain. It's an amazing way to present a comedic villain. <laughs> If you're doing a comedy and that's your villain's plan, I'm there. I would watch that. (laughs) All right. Uh, It definitely uh, counts a little differently when it comes to comedy. Of course. Like what I just said. I'm just just joking around, but yes. (laughs) Like that sounds like something, not something like Vandal Savage would do in Young Justice. That sounds like something Mojo Jojo would do in the Powerpuff Girls. Yes. And that's... Because your villain's got to fit the story you're telling. You cannot switch out Mojo Jojo and Vandal Savage. As much as that would be as amazing fun as that would be, to see. I would love to just see a one-off episode where every villain in the light is just replaced by a Powerpuff Girl villain. That would just make my entire day. Actually, my whole lifetime. That would be amazing. It's like there's this one There's this one episode of Teen Titans Go where that <laughs> that has um, Aqualad, Miss Martian, and Superboy in it, and they're telling the, oh, the Teen okay. Titans about how they need to be more serious, and it's the whole the whole plot of the thing is like the a couple of the heroes from Young Justice showing up and being like, "Your show is too much of a comedy. You need to be more like us." Stop smiling. <laughs> uh, that, but with the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> I would gladly put public funding into that just to see that go down. I really would love to see that. I do know what episode you're talking about, though. I'm not the most familiar with Teen Titans Go, but I do remember that was like one of the major reasons like people's interest in Young Justice was revitalized after the show ended, because I believe that episode came after the cancellation. It did. And I believe interest interest was able to be raised a little bit since Teen Titans Go is a very mainstream cartoon. And I feel like maybe... Maybe, due to that little push, it got us even closer to getting Young Justice Outsiders many years later. I think it's, at least from from my perspective, it's a little bit of like, 
which came first kind of thing because like uh young justice has always had that level of like people very much shouting about how it should come back and that kind there's some talk of like the teen titans go up so it might have been kind of a nod to the fact that years and years later people are still like what if we got a season three uh and at the same time i also believe it totally could have been like they did that episode and even more people were like hey there should be a season three and even then people like I believe Teen Titans Go is mainly targeted at younger, younger kids. Yes, yes. Maybe that episode was able to get them interested in potentially watching Young Justice and bring even like not only younger audiences to be like, hey, we want more Young Justice, but just even more, okay, for lack of a better term, troops to bring to the army of bringing back this show that so many people just love and so many people just hold dear to their hearts. And ultimately those uh, efforts succeeded because now we have the amazingness that is Young Justice Outsiders. Speaking speaking of Young Justice, the thing our podcast is about, what, with all of that in mind, with that whole acronym in mind, what is it about the Young Justice villains to you that you think makes them so interesting and memorable and entertaining? Uh, whether you want to pick a couple or talk about just the general feel of the show, there is so much to talk about about the villains on this show. I think I'll speak for at first in generality, like what are the major aspects to what these villains uh, are able to, why these villains are able to be so memorable in my opinion. Uh, the first main reason is I feel like the tone that the villains they choose, I guess this could also count as focus, is perfect for this show because I love Young Justice. It's a very, it's a darker take on the DC universe. So you'll expect characters like Vandal Savage, Lex Luthor, and Black Manta, those are the perfect characters to introduce in a universe like that. Whereas villains such as Animal Vegetable Mineral Man, I don't think we'll be seeing anytime soon on the show, as much as that would be fun. Well, I love how wild comics are. <laughs> comics are just a, a wild landscape of just imagination and excitement. That's why I love this medium so much. Another reason that I feel like the villains are... Actually, I want to I want to kind of continue on focus because... I feel like the villains they focus on specifically through certain seasons, I feel like they pick it in a, a way that's super appropriate. Like, there's never a specific villain or, like, a member of the light or any other sort of association that I feel like is detrimental to the show. Yeah. I don't think that there's, like, this one villain that's less like, oh, there's no reason for this character. Oh, get off the screen. Each one of these characters serves a story perfectly. Like... I'm going to talk a lot about Vandal Savage because I feel like Vandal Savage is like the definite one of the definitive Young Justice characters. Uh, Vandal Savage in the show, he's able to be like one of the major big bads while also having this amazing story to go along with it. One of my favorite episodes from season three of Young Justice was Evolution. And it was just like this huge kind of spotlight on the character and the way they were able to explain the story, the motivation the other characters associated with him. This is a character that could hold his own spin-off show if needed. And I feel like they're able to use him in ways that is just so, so perfect to the narrative that Young Justice has. And the same can be used for Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor is obviously like one of the big, big villains in the DC universe, so it's obvious you'd have to include him. But the ways they work around the character to be almost like another Greg Weissman production, uh, uh, the main villain, David, it's been a while since I've seen the show, uh, Zanatos, I can't pronounce the last name, I always have trouble with uh, it, Zanatos but he was voiced by John- from, Zanatos, from dang. Yeah, uh, he was voiced by Jonathan Frakes, I'm not good with pronunciations once in a while. No I feel like the way they were able to make him very similar to that character, and to not only add these new layers and dimensions to him, and I feel- like, the way they were able to use him in this specific environment is just perfect for the focus of these villains. And not only is focus and the villains they choose are important to the show, but the way they interpret them is just the creativeness and the way they were able to make it feel like something new while still sticking to the comic books is just unlike anything I've ever seen before in any comic book property, because I could name off, like, 10 villains that I could love from this show off the bat right now. Actually, let me ask you a quick question. When best villain in Young Justice comes to your mind, 
who who's the first person that comes to your head? Oh, that's it's such a big question. Um, I should have I should have prepared for this. I should have assumed this would come up. Weirdly enough, if we're going with best villain from I'm gonna I'm gonna pick one that's not any of the big ones actually. I think Sportsmaster is such a good villain on this show and works so well for the narrative that they're telling. Me, uh, me and a uh, friend of the show, Jeff Stormer, who we just had on an episode recently uh, that will have come out just a couple of weeks before this one. Oh, nice. We were talking about uh, Lex Luthor and Darkseid specifically. We we're talking about Superman's nemeses and talking about how Lex Luthor and some of the other villains on the show each have like a corresponding teen hero that they're like the villain for. Like Simon is right. McGann's villain and Sportsmaster is Artemis's villain and Lex Luthor is Superboy's villain uh, and all of that. And we can get into that later because I do think it is a very interesting way that the show is structured. But when it comes to Sportsmaster and how he's framed in this show, I think part of what makes him so great is that he's not just a supervillain. He's also this very personal antagonist for one of our lead characters because he's Artemis's awful father. And because of that, you get this really interesting narrative that is so central to the way this show does te teen heroes so well in a way that some of the other villains, as awesome as they are, don't necessarily have that same kind of core connection to the idea of the show in some ways which isn't a dig at them they're all awesome in different ways but just the fact that they were also able to make Sportsmaster who is a villain who uses sporting equipment to do crimes a genuine serious villain that you understand and hate because he's an awful person uh, while also understanding why he is the way that he is uh, is just kind of great and that's my that's my answer today. Ask me if somebody asks me again in like a week, I'll be like, well, today <laughs> and someone else. But right <laughs> now, I'm going to say the way that Sportsmaster fits into the, the whole narrative of the show uh, makes him one of the best in this in this show. I might not say he's the best in all of DC Comics, but for this show, he's pretty he's pretty darn great for what this show is doing. How about you? Who are you going to say is the best villain? So I'm not talking forever. <laughs> Um, I'll go back to the uh, uh, what I really like about Sportsmaster momentarily. Yeah. Uh, but my favorite villains from the show. Uh, ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, definitely Vandal Savage. I uh, I love the way this character is portrayed, as I stated. And something I forgot to mention was both Miguel Ferrer and David Kay. They're able to both bring such raw emotion and intimidation to this role yeah. that I just every time I hear him speak, I'm just like. I feel like I should hide behind the couch, you know? I'm just get like so like you just get like chills down your spine every time you hear him talk. And another villain that I feel like is really, really uh I really like just because personality wise, I love Clarion. Oh, I so love fun. that is just such a really fun, a really likable character, despite being an a lord of chaos. He's got a chaos boy. Yeah, <laughs> He's just so chaos. He's just got this amazingly intriguing personality. You want to know more about what happened beforehand in the show with this character and prior interactions with him. And he's voiced by, uh, I believe it's pronounced uh, Tom Addix. Uh, it's T-H-O-M-A-D-C-O-X. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And he's able to make this role uh, seem also a mixture of both this really bratty kid but this unstoppable force in nature that's just monstrous. And I really like that character so much. Yeah. And I can't tell you how much I enjoyed seeing him return in Outsiders. And I hope we get to see more of him in Phantoms in some capacity. But going back to your Sportsmaster uh, kind of highlight, there are two things I wanted to say about that. One is something you already brought up. Sportsmaster in the comics is kind of a, a, goofy, a goofy character. He's so goofy that, fun fact... Uh, James Gunn, who's well known for using very eccentric characters, like in his upcoming Suicide Squad movie, he's using Polka Dot Man, Arm Fall Off Boy. He was apparently considering using Sportsmaster, and even though that'd be the perfect character for him to utilize, 
you got to keep in mind that this is a very silly, very quirky character. And like you said, Young Justice is able to make him feel extremely powerful, extremely diabolical, and just so sinister in the way he interacts with his daughters. And just this just really unpleasant just idea that this man who has such a silly gimmick can be such a such a problematic force in these young heroes' lives. And another thing I wanted to mention about Sportsmaster is the voice actor. I talk a lot about people's performances. I always tend to like see, oh, who's this type of person? Who does he voice? What does he bring to the role? Uh, Nick Chinland, uh, who voices Spoits- Sportsmaster, Sportsmaster, that sounds like a Jersey term. <laughs> Sportsmaster is voiced by Nick Chinland. And I love the gravelly, raspy voice that he brings to the role. It's not like deep and booming like uh, Vandal Savage yeah. or Lex Luthor. It's very, like, very raspy, but at the same time, it's just so diabolical. It just feels like, it feels like an appropriate fit for this kind of character. And I will also want to bring up that I was kind of sad at the fact that Sportsmaster was such a big character in the first two seasons. He only got, like, one appearance in Triptych. I would have liked to have seen more char- uh, more of him in Season 3, and I'm hopeful maybe we could see a little bit more of him in um, Phantoms as well, along with Clarion, who is... I would definitely put Sportsmaster up there as like one of my top favorite Young Justice villains as well. Yeah, I I totally agree. I would love to see more Sportsmaster. It's the thing with season three that is both the it's the combination of both one of the coolest things about season three is that there are so many characters and that you are telling these huge DC universe stories. And at the same time, it's one of like those things that's kind of frustrating about season three. Where you're like, but there's so many characters, right? <laughs> uh, like. Me and one of my friends are like, Cheshire only shows up like twice. <laughs> Where's <laughs> Cheshire? <laughs> like that kind of feeling where you're like, there's so many characters and we're so invested in so many of them. Uh, that I I hope in season four we get to see more of a bunch a bunch of different people and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. I feel like with um ensemble casts like in Young Justice, not only in the show but in any other type of productions. That's both the upside and the downsides to having a really big cast of characters. Amazing characters you can fall in love with. For example, one of my favorite DC characters of all time is Tim Drake. I'm a huge Tim Drake fan. And I was really, really unhappy that uh, Cameron Bowen was only able to do one episode as Tim in Outsiders. Because I would have loved to have seen more of Tim develop his relationship with Cassie a bit. Because I love the characters of both Tim Drake and Cassie Sandsmark. But at the same time... When you look at the characters they do put focus on in these big ensemble shows, you can understand why they do it, why they choose the characters. Because these characters, like in Outsiders, I like Cyborg, I like Halo, I like these stories, I like these arcs. And you can see the reasons why they choose them and why they choose to stick by them, because these are characters that help benefit the narrative. And every time I see them on screen, it's a scenario where it's like, okay... Uh, it's not a character I would have initially thought of putting focus on, but I'm still going to watch and I'm still invested. And I feel like that's one of the great things about Young Justice is you never know who's going to be at the lead. But when they are at the lead, you're just sucked in. I absolutely agree. Young Justice manages its giant ensemble cast very well. And since season three was focused on the outsiders, they were the title of the season. Uh, we'll Indeed. see. We'll see if season four focuses on a different team more specifically. We don't know yet. We're really we don't know much about season four yet. I would love for there to be more information about fandoms in the near future. I'm really hopeful that we'll be getting like some sort of idea what the season will look like because I've been waiting so long for season four now. It feels like it's been an eternity. The same goes for season three. I kind of had the same feeling, like along with everyone else, like it takes so long. But hey, perfection takes time, you know. Though I will, I will take this moment to remind everyone, we got the announcement that season four was happening before production on season four really began, which isn't generally how these things work. So people are used to like, oh, when they announce something at Comic-Con, it's already well underway and we'll get a trailer really soon and stuff like that, which wasn't how either the third or fourth seasons of Young Justice announcements have gone. So people feel like it's taking forever when really it's just this is how long things take. People just don't generally announce them this early, but it is always very nice that we know that Young Justice is coming, even though we may not get information for a while because we may not get a trailer or anything for a while. 
So it might take a while, but we know it's coming, which is always nice. And it's always nice to remember that it's like, it ta- it, these things take time. But yeah, we will see what villains appear next season, if and when we find out. Uh, hopefully, hopefully some of our favorites return. You were saying you love Clarion. I would love to see more Clarion. Yes, I love that character so much. And I think one of the things that's so fun about Clarion, to go back to that for a moment as we jump around in all of this, is that Clarion is a very fun, very chaotic villain who has these moments where he is utterly terrifying. And the show does a really good job of lulling you into this sense of feeling like Clarion is a joke and then making him snap. And you're like, oh, oh, right. I'm supposed to be afraid of this guy. Right. Uh, And Mm -hmm. you remember that in ways that work (laughs) really well. I want I want to see more of him and Zatanna fight next season. That's what I would love. I want to see him and Zatanna in a giant wizard battle. (laughs) I would kill to see someone like that. And not only Zatanna and uh, Clarion, maybe we can bring in some of uh, Zatanna's protégés. They said in the audio play that there is more than just Tracy 13. I'm curious to see who that is. I just want Zatanna and her legion of magical girls. (laughs) I'd watch that spinoff. Raising the next generation of magical girls and saving the world. Yes. They can be called Zatanna and the Sabrinas. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> is that it is that a warner brothers property are they allowed to use that <laughs> i believe it is a warner brothers property i'll have to look it up when it's uh this is all over maybe <laughs> but i was also going to say uh something that i'd really like to see involving clarion in the next season is i would really like to see uh this is kind of a minor thing but <laughs> at the very end of early warning you obviously see him in the tower of fate and he's trying to escape I would love for there just to be like a small throwaway line, just like a joke to hear how he got out of there. Maybe it could just be like something, Clarion, how did you get out of the Tower of Fate? Oh, I just went to the exit door. I think it could just be something like still random there. and bizarre. <laughs> I want time skip and he's still there. Uh, no matter how long it is, he, he's just still there. That would be amazing as well. Zatanna's like, I took him off the board for two years, guys. Give me all of my props. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I hope Greg and Brandon are hearing us and we're, like, jotting down these ideas in, like, a notebook or something. No, no, no. As the, as they say on Twitter, and I will remind everyone if they forget on Twitter, they they don't take suggestions and they can't take requests. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, some someday we will have a whole episode. We will find someone who will talk about the whole legal ramifications behind why creators can't do that. And we'll do a one-hour discussion session about that but um (laughs) getting back to villains one thing that i kind of wanted to talk with you about today that i thought would be fun is talking about the way that this show does the great match of matching adult heroes and teen villains and how Mm -hmm. that power dynamic is done really well especially in the first season because of course the first season is our season with most of our tiny teenage heroes uh and later seasons we have more young adults (laughs) and people out who've graduated college but that first season especially kind of focuses on that dynamic and i think it's a really cool interesting dynamic that the show does really well so i thought we could talk about that for a little while if you have any thoughts on that I think the dynamic is uh, very pivotal to the show because uh, something that I really like about the dynamic between, say, older villains and younger adults, um, younger heroes, my bad, uh, is that the foil that they're able to uh, go off against is very uh, apparent. But at the same time, it's also it fits the characters perfectly. Like, take, for example, uh, Superboy and who I think would be a good foil for him, Lex Luthor, his Half-father, I think. I don't know what the precise term would be, but (laughs) kind of like a, let's just say like a stepfather, evil stepfather. I like that. Superboy is obviously in the first season is this very angry, very emotional individual who's still trying to find his footing where he wants to be in this world. Whereas Lex Luthor, not only in the first season, but throughout the entire series, for the most part, he's this very collected, very cool-headed very like, I know what I'm doing. I know what the long game is. I know what I need to do. No one's going to stop me. And even though those two kind of dynamics are a little apparent and they're going up against each other, evil stepfather versus good stepson, I think what I really like about it is the way that they're able to bounce off each other, even though they're supposed to be enemies, is 
I think the way interactions work in the show is just very pivotal to a good villain hero relationship, not only in Young Justice, but in the entire world of fiction and nonfiction, well, non nonfiction. Uh, <laughs> it would be nice to know uh, if there was a nonfiction story with a bunch of villains and heroes and dragons flying everywhere. But yeah, I feel like the interactions between uh, Superboy and Lex Luthor, especially in one of my favorite episodes of season one, Agendas, like there's so much tension in there. There's so much, so much animosity. But at the same time, you just can't help but think, wow, I really want to know what happens next. I want to be sucked in. I want to see more of what else will happen with these characters, what else will happen with their storylines and where it goes from here. And we got a pretty good resolution in that first season. And we're still having to go on to this day in uh, what I hope they continue to do in season four, since Connor is now a public hero. Luthor has been taken down a couple pegs. And I feel like that's a prime example of why I love the dynamics in the show when it comes to adult villains and kid heroes, the interactions and the parallels. To again quote friend of the show, Jeff Stormer, because we were talking we talked about Lex Luthor a lot last time he was here. One of the things that he brought up that I think is so true about why Lex Luthor works so well in this show, despite the fact that he's supposed to be a Superman villain and he's supposed to fight Superman and only be in Metropolis, but works so well in this show across all of the things that it does is because Lex Luthor is kind of framed as this, as like the ultimate adult in some ways. And like he is everything that these teenagers would be like, well, he has all of the power in the world and he can do whatever he wants and buy whatever he wants, but he's also completely untrustworthy and is the perfect symbol of like teens raging against adults telling them what to do all at the same time in a way that works perfectly for telling a story about younger heroes in a way that is not always that isn't really like the role that he plays in Superman's stories because Superman's also an adult. Uh, very true. But it works. <laughs> very true. Uh, but it works so well here because these villains that we are so used to existing in their own stories and in different hero stories represent something different in in this because of the heroes that they're going up against. Like we were saying, the fact that uh, Sportsmaster is someone's dad on this show gives more range and depth to that character than just having him be goofy dude who robs a bank with a football <laughs> uh, because now there is this interpersonal relationship and he's not just sports themed villain he's someone's awful dad and he is the representation of everything this teenage girl does not want to become and he is part of a tragic backstory and he's all of these things that only really work if you let your main characters be vulnerable young heroes that have their own ideals and their own ideas of the way the world should work versus a completely different, not only mindset, but a completely different generation that they are fighting. Right. I feel like those are really, really strong points. And now that the more and more I think about it, it's just the more and more I just feel like, wow. The way that uh, Greg and Brandon are able to make these villains and are able to take, like, say, one note villains, like, say, Sportsmaster, like you said, I feel like we're ratting on Sportsmaster a lot in this episode. And I feel kind of bad, like his original comic uh, storyline. But um, he was supposed to be a weird, goofy, wild sports themed villain. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. That's like true. No wonder James Gunn would have considered him for something like Suicide Squad with uh, Arm Fall Off Boy. I'm still really <laughs> excited for that movie. I love James Gunn so much. But I was going to say, uh, the way that Greg and Brandon and everyone else at that uh, department just are able to make these villains not only have these interlying connections to our heroes, but are able to make them intriguing, funny, smart, and just so investing. I don't think there will ever be another show out there like Young Justice that has these good of villains, these rich of antagonists. Like, I want to use Lex Luthor again as an example. I've seen millions of Superman Justice League adaptations, and Mark Rolston's portrayal of Lex Luthor in the show is one of the best Lex Luthors out there. You've got, like, Michael Rosenbaum as Lex Luthor in Smallville. You've got Clancy Brown as Lex Luthor in uh, the DCAU. 
And Mark Rolston is up there with those great Lex Luthors, like with Gene Hackman, John Cryer. We do not talk about Jesse Eisenberg. And these are just so, like, rich characters. And it's just so amazing to think that a show like Young Justice can give us one of the great Lex Luthors. And I feel like they've been able to deliver a definitive version of villains like, this is the best Sportsmaster. I love Sportsmaster <laughs> in um, uh, Stargirl. I like what they're doing with that character. But when I think of Sportsmaster, I think of Young Justice. When I think of Clarion, I think of Young Justice. When I think of Vandal Savage, I think of Young Justice. Uh, you can see what's going and so on and so on. Yeah. And it's really great for a show with this amount of writing, this much passion and attention to create these villains that are not only beloved, but people like me who consider them the definitive version of these characters. I love these villains so much, and I would gladly watch 10 million spinoffs based around character villains who have just had like one note appearances. I would watch a spinoff about Toy Man. I would totally <laughs> watch something like that. Let Cameron Bowen play Toy Man again, 2021. <laughs> yes, let Cameron Bowen do every single role on the show because he's a really <laughs> talented guy. And we're actually friends with, We're actually friends on Instagram. He's a really nice guy. He is. I've met him. He's great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I agree. All of this show does a great job of distilling these characters down into a way and it's heroes, it's villains, it's everyone. We talk about this all the time of making the heart of all of these characters shine through in this universe that is so different from a lot of other DC universes, but still all of the characters feel very real and very genuine and very, very right for not just this universe, but for what people imagine that character to be in ways that just work. Like we've talked before about how Lex Luthor, we go back to Lex Luthor all the time, but it's only because he shows up in every season and does so much. Um, Which is not a bad thing. <laughs> not a bad thing at all. Is that Lex Luthor on this show is so interesting to watch because he is a character that just gives everyone exactly what they want and then forces right. them to go, okay, so why am I the bad guy? I've given you everything you've asked for. Why am I the bad guy? Uh, which is a brilliant move to have your villain be something like that, where you have to sit there and go, wait, why is he the villain again? How do we, we have to break it down? Uh, why does this character think of this person as a villain? Like everything that happens with Arsenal in season two and like getting his cybernetic arm and everything like that and how Arsenal's kind of like makes that deal with Lex Luthor and just takes it because he's like, yeah, this is what I want. Why would I say no to this? Wait, <laughs> this guy's supposed to be evil kind of thing. And how all of these characters kind of have those moments with him specifically. And even with, with any of the villains, how the show does a good job of forcing these characters to every now and then kind of ask themselves, okay, why is what I'm doing okay? Why is what they're doing not okay? And finding, answering those big moral questions in whatever way it can. I think both the idea of the heroes and the audiences uh, questioning whether or not this antagonist is even that bad of a person is, I think, is a brilliant storytelling move. It makes the audience feel kind of kind of wary on whether or not we should feel for this guy, trust him, or just be like, yeah, this is just a facade. For as charismatic as some villains can be, you know that they're just true scumbags all the way down to yeah. the core. And Absolutely. I just love those types of characters. Like some of my favorite villains are just ones that you could totally sit back and have a drink with. And as soon as you're done with your drink, he'll just shoot you. And <laughs> like, it'll just be completely out of nowhere. It's like something from a Quentin Tarantino movie. Those are the type of villains I love. And I love the fact that they're able to utilize them so much in the show. I feel like a good example. Uh, I really like one that we haven't even mentioned yet is a uh, Queen Bee. Uh, Queen Bee is a very... She has a very calming voice. She's voiced by Marina Sirtis, who plays uh, Deanna Troy in Star Trek The Next Generation, for anyone who doesn't know. She's very calm. She's very collected. She's very charismatic. But at the same time, she's just one of the most slimiest characters on the show. This is the character that killed Garfield Logan's mother. Yeah. This is the character that's just done so many heinous actions. But at the same time, you just got to sit back and be like, Wow. I could totally spend just a good couple hours with this character just having a conversation before she convinces me to jump, throw myself off a cliff with her with her powers because I believe she has the powers of persuasion. Yeah. And I really think that 
I love those kinds of characters, and I love that there are so many of those kinds of characters in the light and not associated with the light on the show. And even, like, the reverse of that kind of, like, Black Manta is a character where we're like, you have committed many crimes and you have killed many people, but also, when your son abandons you to go back to being a hero, the right thing to do, I still kind of feel a little bad for you. Right. Uh, (laughs) Like, we've talked about that. The the moment where, it, like, him and Calder have that face-off near the end of season two, you're just like, like, I know, Calder, you should be a hero. You should rejoin the, the Justice League and everything. But also, I, ca- I feel just a tiny bit bad for your dad. Just a tiny bit. And then I remember all of the crimes. Right. Or, like, Cheshire. Me and I know many people love Cheshire, who is a villain and is an assassin. And at the same time, I'm consistently like, can Cheshire just have a good day? (laughs) Right. Uh. (laughs) Uh, Cheshire, uh, both Cheshire and um, the Black Manta, I really like those characters for what you just stated. Like, these are characters you know are bad guys. You know they're the antagonists. But at the same time, there's a part of you that just feels like, I would love to see Cheshire just go back to her kid and her husband. And at the same time, with Cal- with Calder and uh, Black Man, it's like, I want to see these two have a good relationship. They're not, these are huge, these are people after all. These these are villains where we're like, can you reform? Can you be a hero so you can have yeah. a good relationship with your family? Like, there will never be like a show where every villain is reformed. But at the same time, you just feel like there's a part of you that's like, I want to see these guys have a good future together. I don't want to see Black Manta being a part of the Suicide Squad, as cool as that is, and being at the end of uh, Leverage being like, Calderum, it makes my stomach turn to see you in that suit. Well, father, I guess you won't have to, considering you'll be in your jail cell. Like, that's a cool (laughs) moment, but at the same time, it's also really kind of sad, you know? Yeah. I was going to say, though, it's like, I really want to see something blossom between these two, because we did see that in Invasion, but now that all kind of came crumbling down with uh, everything that went down, it's cool to see them kind of be like enemies again. But at the same time, there's also a somber sense of this could have been a very close father-son relationship, even though they do these horrible things. But unfortunately, there will never be that opportunity again, most likely. They will just be yeah. stuck being Aquaman and Black Manta, not father and son. Yeah. And that kind of tragedy is part of what makes that storyline work so well in a way that wouldn't if he was just here is an aquatic themed villain for our aquatic themed hero uh would be like that's cool that's fun they can have a ocean battle over there but giving them that personal relationship and that sense of these two people could have been had a great relationship if it wasn't for you know All of the everything. (laughs) Precisely. Perfect way to sum it up. Makes that story so much more compelling and so much more interesting to watch. Agreed. And I'm going to go off topic for a second because uh, I love the 2018 James Wan Aquaman movie. Uh, I assume you've seen it, right? I have not. (laughs) Oh, okay. I won't give away too much then. But obviously, (laughs) based off the trailers, uh, we see uh, Black Manta. And they've already confirmed we're getting a sequel next year in 2022. I feel like if they were able to perfectly portray this father-son relationship that's really saddening, but at the same time really intriguing as well on TV, maybe they could all do it in the movies. Because when you get a chance to see Aquaman, Black Manta is one of the highlights. And I want to see more of this cinematic take on the character. And maybe when we get Aquaman 2, Aquaman 3, maybe even Aquaman 4, I want to see them bring in Calder. I want to see them bring in this father-son relationship between Calder and Black Manta. I want to see if they can do it as masterfully as Young Justice did, because I would like to see that at a cinematic quality, too. Yeah, one can always hope. I always I always want the characters from Young Justice showing up in more things. Me oh, too, man. They're so good. I We have talked many times where we're like, I just want I just want every character on Young Justice and everything. <laughs> I would love um, to see a whole Young Justice movie set in the DC Extended Universe and Even a TV show, maybe set in the Arrowverse, that would be a dream come true. We have Titans, but I feel like Titans and a Young Justice show would be different very tone-wise. Yes, yeah. I love talking about villains not only in Young Justice, but in the entire DC Universe. And going back to another point, 
the DC Extended Universe, I strongly recommend checking out some of their newer movies because a lot of those newer movies like Shazam, Birds of Prey, Wonder Woman, those are phenomenal comic book movies. I strongly recommend checking them out. Yeah. Speaking of villains, Birds of Prey, very good movie that makes you care about definitely a villain. Gosh, I love Birds of Prey. <laughs> Birds of Prey is the, so weird and I love it. Uh <laughs> I think Birds of Prey arguably has one of the best DCU villains out there in the form of Ewan McGregor's Black Mask. Why wasn't Ewan McGregor the Joker? Like, that is just such a fun, likable, hammy, terrifying character. The, we're seeing Roman Sionis. I kind of see Jack Napier. Like, Ewan McGregor would have been an awesome Joker had they given him the opportunity, you know? Yeah. Villains. Villains everywhere. <laughs> right. Villains, villains everywhere. You thought you were going to be getting a discussion about Young Justice villains. I'm going off about a discussion about any kind of villains in the <laughs> expanded DC universe and just all over, you know? I'm going to different universes. I'm talking about Marvel. I'm talking about uh, Valiant Comics, everything, you know? <laughs> it happens, man. You get a couple of nerds in a room and just let them go. Uh, we will yep. talk nonstop about everything. But. I think we're I think we're starting to starting to wind down. If we're going off the rails and just talking about DC Universe, D Marvel Universe, if we're starting to talk about everything. We might just have to wrap it up for the day. <laughs> so, as we're getting near kind of near the end of our hour, what let's throw it back to what are some villains that you think the show has hinted at or that you'd love to see in the next season or in the future seasons? What are some villains that you'd be totally hyped if they showed up next season? Uh, starting off with villains that they've hinted at and villains we've seen that we could potentially get more of. Uh, hinted at, obviously at the end of Outsiders, we get a teaser of the Legion of Superheroes. I think it would be fun to bring in a lot more intergalactic DC villains. Like, the first one that comes to my mind is Imperiax. I think that would be, like, a really fun character to dig into in Phantoms. But sticking also on a more down-to-earth level basis... Two characters that I really liked in Outsiders that I wish got a little more attention and I'm hopeful we'll see more of is Mist and Livewire. I really yeah. like those two. We saw them in, I believe, two episodes. I like that we got their personalities down. Mist is a little more soft-spoken, very apologetic. Livewire is very snarky, a lot more fearless. But at the same time, they seem to have this close friendship, whether it be romantic or sisterly. And there is a part of me that wonders, maybe we could see more of them in the future, because I would love to either see them uh, fighting off the team, since they're obviously misunder like they're obviously uh, confused teenagers, or maybe if they want to do something like a redemption arc, maybe we could see them join maybe the Outsiders or the team, maybe do a bit of a departure from the comics. That would be really fun to see, because I do like those characters a lot. As for characters who have not appeared on the show yet, I have three. There are three characters that I would really like to see. Number one, this is kind of an interesting one because back in season one, we had the Injustice League and I mentioned a couple times my love for the Joker. That is like one of my favorite, that's probably my favorite DC villain of all time. At the same time though, I feel like they could have done a lot better with the Joker they had in season one. And the way I feel like we can work around this is there's a TV show called Gotham that went from 2014 from 2019 <laughs> Yes. And the way they explained it is that the Joker is not a man, but an idea, a philosophy. And so I feel like if they were to bring the Joker in again in future seasons, I think it'd be really fun to see maybe a new take on the Joker. Someone who's not the Joker we saw in Revelation, but somebody completely new. For all we know, the Joker we saw, that could be Jack Napier. But maybe we could see other characters, like maybe we could see a Valeska, maybe we could see a John Doe, maybe we could see a Joseph Kerr. I think it would be fun to dig into, are there other Jokers out there? Are there other people, psych psychopaths, who adhere to this fanaticism and ideologies that the Joker uh, tends to preach, even though he's a complete psychopath? And I think that would be really interesting to dig into. I also just think uh, part of... I think part of the reason that uh, for a lot of people the Joker didn't work in season one that they could make work in season four is having him in the midst of like four other villains fighting off a bunch of non-Gotham characters always feels weird for the Joker yeah. in ways that it doesn't for some characters. And if they did like, because we've seen Tim Drake and 
Cassandra Kane and the and spoiler and the the whole Gotham City detectives kids crew or whatever I called them last season at, as like a little mini Gotham team of having like them go up against the Joker or something like that could work really well of kind of grounding the Joker as like a a single villain set in Gotham the way that he generally is even if he's not going up against Batman, but is going up against some of the teen heroes, could also work really well in this kind of, in the format that Young Justice does, I feel like. I definitely agree. Like when you watch a DC production, you don't want to see the Joker go up against Amethyst, Princess of Gem World, or Challenges of the <laughs> Unknown. You want to see the Joker go up well. against Batman. That would be cool, but you want to see the Joker go up against Batman, Robin, Nightwing, Batgirl, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I do think it would be nice to see the Joker go up against more Bat family members in the future. Yeah. And we have an extensive Bat family on Young Justice at this point. Indeed. Like, I I always tell people this, like, if we were to ever get a Young Justice spinoff, I would chop off my own arm if I could see a Bat family spinoff, man. I want to see more of Tim Drake. I want to see more of, say, Barbara Gordon. I want to see more of potentially Harper Rowe as Bluebird, since she obviously becomes Bluebird in the comics. I would love a whole Bat family spinoff. But uh, sticking to the other villains I'd love to see, another one I'd really like to see is the Reverse Flash. I think it would be fun to bring in a couple evil speedsters. Not only Reverse Flash, but maybe we could bring in a couple like, say, we could bring in Kid Inertia, we could bring in The Rival, we could bring in Godspeed. But the Reverse Flash is like the first evil speedster you think of when you think of an evil speedster. And I think it would be fun to bring in Eobard Thawne and see what kind of mayhem he brings to the table. And uh, finally... I know I said earlier that I like how Young Justice is very grounded and down to earth, but once in a while, you can have a little silliness. Like, Nightmare Monkeys was a very eccentric episode in season three. So hear me out. I am a huge fan of musicals. I love musicals so much. I know who you're going to say. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I want to see a Young Justice musical episode with the music meister. Booyah. Yeah, that would. It's one of those things where it's like, I feel like they'd never do it because it doesn't fit the overall tone of the show. But if we could have another Nightmare Monkeys Fever Dream style yes. episode where we could get the like Batman the Brave and the Bold music maestro episode, it would be hilarious. There is actually, to be fair, I will actually say. To anyone who's interested in the idea of a Young Justice musical, people are. Uh, this is uh, this is a winding road, but I will get there. The Torch Song comic, uh, the digital comic that was released right before season three came out, that is the Miss Martian Hello Megan episode comic book thing. People know what it is. There's a comics commentary episode we did about it. It's great. An early draft, I would say, of that story was performed at a comics convention that Greg Weissman goes to every year and does a staged audio play of a bunch of his different uh, shows combined into one thing. He's been doing this for a couple of years. Spectacular Spider-Man, Gargoyles, Young Justice audio plays where it's cast at the convention with fans who want to participate and any of the actors that might be there. And they do a whole thing and they're great. And you can find a bunch of them on YouTube. The one that kind of later evolved into Torch Songs, because it has a lot of the similar plot elements of the Miss Martian getting sucked into an episode of Hello, Megan, them being at a convention, a bunch of stuff. It's all in there. Is a musical. (laughs) They wrote and performed a musical episode of Young Justice Gargoyle Spectacular Spider-Man uh, in like three days at a convention. So if you want a hint of what a Young Justice musical could be like, go find that and watch it because it's amazing. I think it'd be really like going staying on that topic. I think since... Fun fact, uh, Greg Weissman actually, despite the spectacular Spider-Man being a very grounded show, he had intent on doing a musical episode like in season four or season five, I believe. So if there can be such a down-to-earth show like that, maybe a musical episode is possible for Young Justice because when your lead, one of your leads is voiced by Jesse McCartney, who sings Beautiful Soul and How Do You Sleep, you cannot have him sing in some capacity, you know? We'll see, man. 
Yes. It would be it would be amazing. I would love to see the music, uh, the composers for Young Justice uh, take a stab at a Young Justice musical. <laughs> it would be amazing. I would put so much money on that. Like, if they had to publicly fund it, I would put my entire life savings into that project. I want that so, so bad. <laughs> well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what season four brings. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed for a musical episode. And if not that, more Clarion, more Sportsmaster, more of all of the amazing villains that we love on this show. Agreed. So, Connor, thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower. Where can people find you here on Earth Prime? Uh, people can find me on Instagram, my only social media page, at C-O-N-N-O-R-T Davenport. Uh, I am also on Archive of Our Own, where I write my own fan fiction under the name Clockwork Firefly, all one word. And certain uh, series I have include one about Billy Batson during the first years of Young Justice after he was outed out as Captain Marvel. And a new series that I'm doing that's set after Outsiders that involves a character by the name of Joey Wilson, who's associated with uh, Deathstroke, who suddenly comes into the lives of these heroes. And they're trying to figure out how they can incorporate him into this world while also trusting him, while also being the son of the world's deadliest assassin. Other than that, though, uh, you can also reach me at DCTV at Connor.Davenport at DCTV News if you want to email me about anything. Awesome. Thank you to everyone for spending some time with us, too. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at TheYJFiles.tumblr.com, and at our own website, CrashingTheMode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, everywhere that you get your podcasts. If that isn't enough, you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones and you would be making our lives so much easier. If you are able to support us monetarily and want to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do a bunch of incredible stuff for the podcast, whether it's in-person interviews when those eventually become a thing again, or even more discussion sessions with amazing guests and so much more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well